a mysterious disappearance. She hadn't been contacted on the phone for almost a week. And two best friends sharing a secret. She stayed a uh, bad, bad boss there. Then one tells, and the other is hell-bent on the ultimate revenge. Who would imagine a defendant tries to order up a hitman like she's ordering a pizza? Hiring a killer to get rid of the only witness. But her friend has a surprise of her own. A little bit of a beating before she, we got to this point. She'll have duct tape over her mouth. This hit is staged. Now who's stinging whom? Picture perfect. Plus, we spent days, months, years looking over our back. A little league coach and the stalker terrorizing his family. You all better watch your backs. But the real shock was who wanted them out of the game. I could feel my knees starting to shake. Killing with kindness. And the best friend with looks, charm. Your hair is so beautiful. Oh, I love your dress. And a whole lot of stories. She said that her dad would give her thousands of dollars when she was sad. But there's one thing she left out. She is a professional liar and a thief. Now the chase is on to catch her before she fleeces someone else. V, you messed with the wrong girls. Best frenemies. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Best friends, they're supposed to be the people who sustain us. But what happens when they turn out to be our worst enemies? Coming up, three tales of trust and treachery and three women determined to turn the tables on those who betrayed them. First, a shared secret with life-altering consequences. But when one friend decides to tell, the other one decides to get even permanently. As Matt Gutman first reported in 2015, that's only the beginning of this story. For any predator, this lush vegetation obliged by murky brown water at the very end of the Florida Everglades is exquisite terrain, especially to dispose of someone you just killed. This may look like the site of a bloody murder scene, but hold on, folks, this is not what it seems. And what is about to happen to the victim is the key to a twist tale of betrayal and revenge. It is one of the craziest and bizarre murders I've ever studied. All right, so Augie, let's come over here. See, these guys are not from the coroner's office. They're an elite squad of Broward County Sheriff's officers called the Viper Unit. They've given 2020 unprecedented access to this elaborate sting designed to foil a murder plot against this woman, Maria Calderon, who's just become one of the walking dead. How's it feel to rise from the dead? <laughs> To understand the story of this photo, start by taking a look at this photo. That's Maria back in happier times with her bosom buddy, Jacqueline Luongo. Uh, we've got for each other, yes. I guess it's not so common that someone who cares for another person would want them dead. That must hurt. Yeah. Maria makes ends meet by working in a restaurant, but Jackie is having money trouble. That is, until she makes a special arrangement with this woman. Pat Vivieros, one of the countless retirees who decide to live out their golden years in the sun-drenched splendor of South Florida. She was uh, very funny and loving. She uh, loved animals. If you ever needed her, if you were in a jam or whatever, she would be there for you. But Pat needed help getting around. She agreed to let her friend Jackie live with her in exchange for some occasional driving. At the time, it made sense. They were friends, and besides, they both loved dogs. Pat was living off her pension and an annuity from a life insurance policy worth 50 grand. She'd swing by the local bank to pick up her regular checks, and police say when Jackie figured this out, visions of money and murder started dancing in her head. When you have no money, no apartment, no gas for your car, $50,000, in her opinion, was worth more than Pat's life. She exchanged Pat's life for $50,000. Then in August 2014, Pat Vivieros disappeared. She hadn't been contacted on the phone for almost a week. But wait, a woman matching Pat's description is later seen at this bank trying to cash Pat's most recent check. Then, for reasons still unknown, Jackie has a revealing conversation with her old friend Maria. She stayed uh, bad, 
that was dead. That was dead? Yes. Did you realize it was a confession when she told you? Yes. Why did Jacqueline spill the beans to Maria? She uh, thought she could trust Maria. But if Jacqueline thinks her friend is loyal enough to help her get away with murder, she's profoundly mistaken. Instead, Maria calls the cops, telling them Jackie can be found behind the wheel of this banged-up Toyota Solera. Pretty big break. Yeah, it was. Once that tag is run, the alert's coming back to uh, a vehicle that we're looking for, potentially somebody involved in a homicide that we need to interview. Cops, including veteran Broward County homicide detective John Curcio, head straight to Pat's garden apartment. There may have been a small struggle in the bedroom, but one of the dressers was kind of knocked out, off to the side, out of place, but uh, you know, it wasn't like there was a huge uh, altercation. The officer, you know, going in the closet is what found her in a garment bag, and she was in an advanced state of uh, decomposition. Sign of strangulation, pillow? Well, her head was entirely encased in tape. Like mummified? That would be a good description. We still don't know how many days she sat decaying, decomposing in that closet. Think about it. She just didn't deserve it. I mean, that's just the bottom line. The coroner would officially say Pat died of asphyxiation. Jacqueline is tracked to this cheap motel and arrested. Her body, cops claim, shows signs of a struggle, as well as evidence of some criminally mediocre tattoo work. Curcio says he knows Jackie did it and why. Hide the victim's body as long as possible and keep on accessing withdrawals from the life insurance policy. She's actually purchased a wig so that as she's attempting to cash checks, you know, she's a blonde female rather than a brunette. Remember that bank video? Guess who? So she's impersonating the person she killed. She's impersonating the person she killed whose checks she's trying to cash. Jacqueline Luongo puts on a wig to look like Patricia. That's video the jury will certainly appreciate. New details on a disturbing discovery in Deerfield Beach. The As the bizarre murder makes the local news. The sheriff's office has arrested a woman they say killed her roommate and then tried to hide her body. Jackie is charged with murder. But Jackie decides to ignore her right to remain silent. Instead, cops say that from behind the walls and concertina wire of the Broward County Jail, Jacqueline Luongo begins concocting a diabolical legal strategy. She was actively soliciting within her cell a group of people. Does anyone have anyone who could help me remove a witness? Craig Brown runs the Viper unit. He says one of their jailhouse informants has tipped them off. Jacqueline is planning another homicide. I feel like you'd want to be keep that kind of thing secret. You'd be surprised. You'd think that, but you know what? There's got nothing but time, and our suspect in his case was actively seeking to anyone who would listen. Hey, do you know anyone who may be able to help me take out a witness? That witness? Who else? Jacqueline's old friend and confidant, Maria Calderon. What could possibly cause this woman to want you dead so badly? Uh, because in her twisted mind, she thought that with no witness, there was going to be no case and she can walk out. Now the Viper unit swings into action and the sting is on. Hello, this is a free call from an inmate at North Broward Detention Center. The informant puts Jackie on the phone. She thinks she's been hooked up with a bona fide hitman named Neil. At lunch, no less, enjoying some of South Florida's best conch chowder. Hey, Neil, how are you? How's it going? Good, good. 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 But this guy's really one of Craig's guys. That's why we can't show you his face. You said you want to call somebody? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what I want to talk to you about first is, is that um, I, can, I have some money in my property. As Neil finishes his meal, the caller orders off the menu. One dead Maria Calderon served cold. The negotiations begin. So you feel comfortable and you know things can be done right? I'll do half, half up front and half at the end when half when it's done. So you know you're getting what you want. Okay. And, uh, you know, we talked about two and two though, right? I thought it was four. The exact amount is uh, 3900 That's how much I have. Okay, so, all right, call for it. So do, do two up front and the rest when it's done. Okay. The deal is sealed and apparently so is Maria's fate. For just under four grand, one murder coming right up. And Neil adds one final touch. When it's done, you know, I was going to show you some pictures so you know that it's done. Okay. But so you're not, you're not going to see it on the news, so I'll take some pictures and you can see the pictures so you know it's okay. done before I give you a pass. Ah, the Viper unit is playing its mark like a Stradivarius. And before the music stops, Jackie will face the fake hitman. The 
fake lawyer and a fake corpse. Kind of a crazy thing to have to do, right? And a very real reckoning with justice. I just love it when a killer's plan all fits together. Stay with us. It's just another whole hump perfect day of fresh air and ocean along Florida's Atlantic coast. This is where Jacqueline Luongo yearns to breathe free. Instead, she's doing morning calisthenics inside the Broward County Jail. Charged and held for the murder of her roommate, Pat Vivieros, and police say her South Florida crime spree is far from over. It's all or nothing for, for Jacqueline. From jail, she's been trying to hire a hitman to take out the state's prime witness, her former friend, Maria Calderon. I think Jacqueline's mindset was, if I remove this witness, there's no one to keep me in jail. But the Broward County Undercover Viper Unit has hatched a plot of its own. First, an undercover cop posing as Neil the Hitman goes to meet Jacqueline in jail. He has to be sure the dastardly plot is real. How confident were you when you were going in there that you were actually going to get her? I wasn't sure what to expect. We've spoken multiple times up to this point. She knew I was coming. So I was pretty confident that, we, that it was going to go the way that we wanted. Now, why does she have to kill the witness? Why couldn't she intimidate the witness? Have you beat her up or threaten her or do something? Initially, she talked about that, just sending a message telling the witness not to testify. And then she decided that that wasn't going to work for her. She needed to do more. And she changed her mind and said that she wanted the witness completely eliminated. When I leave you here today, it may last. I might talk to you until it's done. Okay, so you're 100%. 200. Okay, okay. While his undercover camera rolls, he jots down the details every hitman needs. Short brown hair, Hispanic. 200 pounds, okay. The game is afoot. I plan on doing it Saturday night. Call me Saturday night, I'll let you know, yes, we're good. I mean, who would imagine a defendant tries to order up a hitman like she's ordering a pizza behind bars? Not knowing whether Luongo contracted other hitmen to kill Maria, the deputies move quickly. We are there the night they go to brief her on the situation, which they insisted on doing off camera. All right, so we just left Maria. What did she say? She's in, surprisingly enough. Um, she she wants to cooperate. I think she understands how serious it is, and she she's going to cooperate 100%. Were you surprised? Yeah, I, I thought it would take a lot more convincing. To have a murder, you need a dead body. Just hours after meeting Jacqueline, I'll just tape it together like that. Our fake hitman and the Viper team have a plan to fake Maria's death, involving a swamp, duct tape, and a bullet hole. Do you want a black eye? And some bruises, or he may be on This has got to look authentic. So the Broward Sheriff's Office hires a professional makeup artist. And you want to make it look like she has been shot, but it's not too fresh. Right, a little bit of a beating before she, we got to this point. Now let's do her hands. She'll have duct tape over her mouth. So she was taken from someplace else, brought here, and shot here. So is that a specific color that's just meant to be blood, or can it be it's used? It's called real blood. It's called real blood. It's kind of a crazy thing to have to do, right? Oh, yeah. Stage your own death. Mm -hmm. After that quick visit to Marlboro Country... We'll let Maria do the blood. Maria is ready for her close-up. So they're applying even more blood right now. The whole idea here is to make this murder for hire look as convincing as possible. And right now, I got to say that Maria looks pretty much like a corpse. There is a gunshot wound to the temple forehead, an exit wound on the other side, dirt on her shirt, her pants, her hands are bound. And of course, she's got that duct tape on her mouth. You've staged deaths before. Yeah. Put your legs this way. Put your mouth a little more. You staged murders before. Yeah. How do people generally react when they have to stage their own murder? We anticipate the blood draining from their face, like, oh my god, I'm I'm shocked. I can't believe someone I know, you know, is making an attempt on my life. And am I in am I in, in any fear? Is the person in any fear? We didn't get that in this particular case. In fact, Maria seems unfazed. All right. If Jacqueline were here, what would you say to her? Looks pretty good, right? Yeah. 
the Viper team now has grisly photos to convince Jacqueline they've just killed a girl named Maria. This is probably what I'll show her tomorrow. But would a real hitman risk a return visit to the jail? Probably not. So Neil tells Jacqueline he needs to leave town, and he's sending this lawyer in his place. So what's going on right now is we're trying to make sure that these two cameras that are going to be hidden on our undercover lawyer here are not going to be too conspicuous, and that takes a little bit of work here. The goal is to get a clean video and make sure that nobody else notices. Jackie ambles into the meeting nonchalantly. The lawyer makes a nervous introduction. I'm so sorry about it. I tracked you all day, I was on my way home, and I, was, I don't like doing this type of stuff, but Neil was, well, he's Neil. He wanted me to have you right now. He gives me very specific instructions. The instructions? First, review the envelope with the ghastly murder photos. Does she react at all? At first she was kind of shaky when she started reading the note, and she opened up the, uh, the second, third pages, and, you know, she's kind of looking at the pictures, and she's kind of, kind of nodding her head, and just like a... Acknowledgement? Yes, yeah, she definitely... Looks good. All right, perfect. Wow. Then sign off on them, literally. The cops want to make sure they have a case beyond any doubt. The way for him is to verify that you saw the picture. Oh, okay, sure. Can you help me out with that? Yeah, sure. Oh my God, you're such a lifesaver. Look, this guy scares the out of me, so. Okay. No yeah. remorse? I mean, any emotion at all? Other than maybe relief. She's not upset about a person losing their life one bit. Right, so I wrote her name on all the pages, too. No visible signs of being upset at all. I think that's what's most shocking, is that she looked at those pictures, which are totally grisly and gory, right? A person who was shot in the head being held by her hair. It didn't blanch, didn't stumble. This is someone who you had a relationship with, you were close with. And to have no effect, you know, whatsoever, I think it really shows the mindset of the criminal. It says, I, I don't, really don't care about anyone else. I'm just worried about my freedom and trying to beat my charge. Hello. Jackie. Afterwards, Jackie even calls her hitman to thank him for a job well done. Hey, how's it going? How did it go? Did, yeah, he, did he show you the pictures? It was good. Yeah, I saw, I saw he showed me and everything was good. Okay, are you happy? Yeah, 100%. Okay. I'm more satisfied customer. <laughs> when Luongo calls the hitman from the jail to tell him what a great job he did, it's like she's giving him a review on Yelp. Jackie is positive that with Maria gone, she'll beat the rap. You think that's going to help? Oh, yeah, no, definitely, yeah, because that was the, that was the only person that was going to say anything. Okay, all right, well, if you're happy, I'm happy. I'm definitely happy. But surprise, surprise, just two weeks later, Jackie is slapped with new attempted murder charges. Solicitation to commit murder and tampering with a witness. Combined with her previous charge in the murder of Pat Vivieros, if convicted, Jackie is facing the death penalty. She declined 2020's request for an interview. Maybe after getting bitten by the Viper unit, she's decided she's done enough talking for now. When you put 12 in the box, this case is it's like tied up with a bow and sitting on top of the Christmas tree, for Pete's sake, for the prosecution to just take down and hand to the jury. It is extremely rare to be handed a case like this on a silver platter. As of 2015, Jacqueline Luongo is still awaiting trial for both the murder of Pat Vivieros and the attempted murder of Maria Calderon. She has pled not guilty to all charges. When we come back, a family terrorized by anonymous letters. We spent days, months, years looking over our backs. And the uneasy feeling the stalker is someone they know. I know where your wife goes every day. I know where your daughter goes to dance school. I was afraid. Stay with us. Chances are, if you throw kids together in an activity, friendships will form. And that holds true for their parents as well. But as Deborah Roberts first reported in 2014, for the family of one Little League player, the gift of friendship masked a sinister plan. Little League season. It's all about team building, right? Well, not exactly. Lately, it's a spectacle that seems to be on instant replay. Oh my God! Nearly every weekend, perceived bad calls leading to bad behavior. Ah! Ah! 
But it's not kid athletes who belong in the penalty box. Stop it, guys! It's their parents. No! Fists. No! Four little words. Free for all brawls. No! Ooh, he just got slam dunked. And what about this out of control dad? So fearful his son's losing a wrestling match, he shoves a 10 year old clear across the ring. Really? But the MVP, Most Vicious Parent Award, may very well go to Janet Chauzy. She may look like an unassuming suburban stay at home mom, but for more than a year, she secretly terrorized her Long Island, New York neighbors. We spent days, months, years looking over our back. It all began one summer. John DeMasi was coaching his son Dominic's baseball team when an angry letter was sent to the league board claiming DeMasi was playing favorites. It was just an anonymous letter sent how wrong I was coaching the team and how bad we were. Then there's another letter and another letter. Who could be so spiteful? Month after month, the letters kept coming. The DeMasi's were scared for their lives. I know where your wife goes every day. I know where your daughter goes to dance school. How much did you alter your lives? I was working and I stopped. I didn't feel safe with, you know, somebody else driving my children. I, I just, I was afraid. There was times I slept out here. I was nervous about who's coming to the door, who's passing by, and it wasn't easy. But the Fed found comfort in friends, including Janet Chusey, a neighbor whose son played ball with Dominic and is in the same school. She suddenly began cozying up to Linda. And Janet was texting me every other day. Texting you about what? A anything. Which nail salon do you go to? Even showing up at Linda's 40th birthday party, uninvited, and here at another event. <sighs> then, weeks later, a special delivery to the Demasi's. And there was two handwritten envelopes in our mailbox. So I opened both of them. One was addressed to my son and one was addressed to me. I made it my life's goal now to observe your family on a 24-7 basis. Don't be planning a vacation anytime soon. You will have no home to come back to. That had to knock you for a loop. I read the letter written to my son, which was just took me down because it just said that if your father doesn't step back, um, I'm going to kill him. You might never see your dad again. You all better watch your backs. This is no joke. This is as real as it gets. They get the hell out of East Metal Base Wall. That's to a 10 year old child. Could you believe that this is stemming from Little League Baseball? A death threat? No, no. I couldn't. But it did. Batten down the hatches, lock up, call the police. This is at a next level. How frightened were your children? We sat him down and explained it. Um, his initial reaction was to put down his glove and his bat and said, you know what, Dad, I don't need to play baseball anymore. Yet the Demasi's refused to give in to their tormentor's demands. John remained the coach, a terrified Dominic still on the team. I was definitely nervous, and when I got up to bat, I felt like someone was always watching me. It definitely made the game more nerve-wracking and harder to deal with. As the frightened families struggled to go on, Nassau County police were sifting through the baseball parent list, looking for anyone who had an ax to grind. And they gradually began focusing on one key piece of evidence, those envelopes that contain the hateful letters. I mean, if you just look at the town and the zip code on every single envelope, you can see that they're all the same handwriting. And another slip up, the stamps were all identical. That uh, made it apparent that we were dealing with the same person on each occasion. But who? Turns out investigators were zeroing in on a parent no one would suspect, that new friend, Janet Chauzy. Some of the content in the letters showed that this person had some intimate knowledge of the family's background. And that's what ultimately led us to Miss Chauzy. But to nail her, police needed a copy of her signature. So Linda DeMasi hatches a plot to trick Chayuzzi into giving her one. Linda has her seven-year-old daughter collect addresses for a fake fundraiser. Chayuzzi takes the bait. The way she wrote East Meadow, it was a certain way. And it, I could feel my knees starting to shake as I was standing there. And I couldn't believe it. A chilling discovery. Linda knows beyond a doubt that her so-called good friend was harboring some bad blood. So suddenly you knew that Janet Chaius was behind it. It was like a, a, a wave just came over us. 
48 hours later, police matched the samples. They had their woman. New this half hour, a Long Island mother arrested, accused of bad behavior. Janet Chauzy was arrested, charged with stalking the DeMasi family. And she made a, a, a full admission to her uh, authoring all the letters and making these uh, malicious accusations. But what could lead a parent to threaten to kill another? Chauzy told police she was angry because John, as coach, didn't choose her son for the Little League travel team. She pled guilty and was sentenced to 60 days in jail and ordered to stay away from Dominic DeMasi. In a statement, her attorney says his client was genuinely remorseful and recognized the seriousness of her crimes. For the DeMasi, justice. But what they didn't get was an apology. I wish that as a mother, she could look at me and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did this. Janet Chayuzzi was released from jail after serving her sentence. Up next, BFFs. They party together, shop together, share everything. She told me that her mom had just died. But this friend was sharing a lot more than she knew. She stole my social security card, debit cards, and $13,000 cash. Setting out to catch a thief when we come back. She got their trust. Then she was suspected of getting pretty much everything else. Money, credit cards, even a passport. That's what a slew of young women say about the woman they thought was their BFF. In 2014, Chris Connolly followed her on the run over months and thousands of miles, leading some to ask, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Can we just pretend? Seems like few could set it off in a club like 24-year-old Vichka Lee. Over the top for everything. Rocking a micro mini with looks to thrill. A lot of crop tops, tight pants, sexy. The woman who called herself V enjoyed life on the dance floor. She loved dancing, drinking. At hot spots in and around Portland, Oregon. She likes attention. She likes to stir stuff up, right? right? Yeah. V's relentlessly over the top attitude had its offbeat appeal for young women like Sonia. I mean, I, d I didn't even know the girl, and it was like, oh my God, I love you. We need to hang out again. For Leilani. She uses her cuteness to make friends and boyfriends. And for 22-year-old Taylor Nunes, this aspiring pastry chef says that at the start of their four-month friendship, V was sweet as pie. Your hair is so beautiful. Oh, I love your dress. Oh, your skin is so nice. Okay, okay that's like a lot of compliments. Away from the bright lights and loud music, Taylor and others would come to suspect that V was a serial identity thief and that she and her famous duck face liked to stick her pals with the bill. She was really good at telling her lies. She is a professional liar and a thief. Despite early misgivings, Taylor became pals with V, who had money to take her shopping. She'd even console Taylor after the death of her beloved Chihuahua, Leopold. After that, she was constantly there for me, and so I thought I could trust her. Before long, V had picked out an apartment for the two of them to share. So obviously both your names were on the lease because you were running it together. Should have been. <laughs> she doesn't have rental history, so her name couldn't be on the lease. That's what she told you. That's what she told me. Pretty soon, strange things started happening. $400 in unfamiliar charges turned up on Taylor's credit card. Then on a shopping run, V flashed some big time cash. And she was buying $2,000 worth of bedroom and house stuff and she was going through her wallet and there was just, there was so much money in there. Only 24 hours later, when Taylor checked her bedroom for the money, did she have an idea where V had gotten all that cash? She stole my social security card, debit cards, and stole $13,000 cash. So right in front of you, yeah. she was buying stuff with the money she'd stole from you 24 hours before? Yeah, I knew that it was her who had to have taken it. This is my bedroom. When Taylor took us to the scene of the alleged crime, her feelings of violation and betrayal were still vivid. I was so distraught, I couldn't even stand on my own two feet. I felt like my whole world was falling apart. Along with Taylor's life savings, something small but precious to her was also missing. My really expensive 
a hair straightener when she'd been the only person in my room. Why aren't you telling her to get her behind out of your apartment too sweet? I was, I was so overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do, what to say. I was, I was a mess. I was, I was in tears. I was crying so hard and she was trying to convince me that the previous tenant could have still had the key and they could have come into the apartment and <laughs> gone through my belongings. Like, most fabricated stories ever, but I was so distraught and this was supposed to be my best friend. In days, V had gone from best friend to frenemy deluxe. Now she was gone, period. She said she was going to go to LA for a week. That was three months ago and still no V. Why do you think out of all your friends in your circle, she picked you? Because I'm gullible. <laughs> I'm not very good at hiding my vulnerability and I believe that she preyed on that. She took advantage of your good qualities. Yeah. How does it make you feel? Pretty awful. Like, it doesn't necessarily pay off to be nice. 16.6 .6 million Americans were victims of identity fraud in 2012, and only 9% got the police involved. But Taylor did. Do you think V qualifies as a friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's absolutely a friend of me, because she is your friend, and then absolutely your enemy. In addition to the cash she took from Taylor, she also stole Taylor's credit card. Detective Patrick Altier picked up Taylor's case, spearheading the investigation into these activities. His check of open cases showed that this wasn't the first time V had been accused of putting her pals through the spin cycle. She sought out a certain type of person, um, became friends with that person, and then would victimized them a little bit over time before doing something to cause her to cut ties with that person and leave. We were best friends. We hung out every single day. 25-year-old Leilani Gutierrez says she and V were also BFFs once. Not for months, for years. She was even a guest at her wedding. She was very bubbly and very positive all the time. Anytime you had a problem, she was always there to listen and, you know, she'd always, you know, answer your phone, always be there. You tell her, you know, Something is wrong. She'd always come over to your house. Then something snapped. After six years of friendship, V blew it all in one 36-hour spree, swiping Leilani's passport and credit card, she says, after they'd gone shopping together and then going buck wild with it on her own. Some clubs, cab rides. She tried to buy airline tickets. On your credit card? Yeah, 13 airline tickets. Did you ever blame yourself? Did you ever think, oh, I shouldn't have left that out or, oh, I shouldn't have? Well, I, why should I blame myself? It's not my fault she's a thief. I mean, maybe I should have, I don't know, been suspicious of my own friend, but then that wouldn't have made me a very good friend either. Have you spoken to her since? Nope. 23-year-old Sonia Cecil remembers V laying it on with a trowel. She was rich. She was studying pediatrics. She had basketball star Jeremy Lin reading her biblical verses. She's actually telling you these things. Yes, and I really hope it's not true. He knows better than that. When Sonia couldn't find another roommate, V moved in. <laughs> the rent? Yeah, about that. V ditched months later, leaving $3,600 unpaid. What happened to that friendship? When you think that your friend is lying to you for an extended period of time, I mean, it just dissolves. This is all of her bedding. To help track down her former friend, Taylor went from victim to crime fighter. At Detective Altier's request, even getting V on the phone. Taylor was an amazing person to work with as far as victims go. Taylor confronted V about the credit card. But she admitted to everything for that. But when Taylor couldn't lure V back to the apartment where she'd be arrested, she went public, like for this report on local news in Portland. Deputies need your help finding a young woman who weasels her way into friendships just to steal thousands of dollars. I don't ever want anyone else to feel what I had to feel. She stole my trust. She broke me. She could be doing this right now. Probably is. It needs to stop. With V on the run, we brought these three women together, now united in their crusade against V. But even with the law on her trail, V couldn't stop Instagramming her whereabouts and her crop top cut off physique. This is her at the Hollywood sign. How about this picture from Las Vegas? Her hair color keeps changing. We have all these pictures of her. They haven't caught her yet. How's that possible? Because I think it's just someone else to come forward and say, hey, she's staying with me right now. You think someone else has to go through what you went through or what Leilani went through? It doesn't through. matter because it's all too late. She's one step ahead of the game every single frickin' time. When we come back, who is V? Her sister reveals the family secrets and a stunning break in the case. She was in L.A. and they, some girl called it a tip. You'll see it all as it happens next.
scenes from a life on the lamb. Mishka Lee, known as V, flashing dance moves and poses from Vegas to LA on Instagram to a host of one-time pals from Portland whom she'd allegedly ripped off for tens of thousands in cash, trips, and luxury goods. Happy Halloween, suckers. I stayed home on Halloween because I was too upset because of her. Because I couldn't face going out because I... Taylor Nunes says she lost everything to V, from her $13,000 in life savings to her $200 hair straightener. But Taylor fought back, setting up a Facebook page dedicated to finding V and getting Detective Patrick Altier to look for V in Portland, Las Vegas, even Los Angeles. Sonia Cecil felt certain V's last dance was drawing near. We're gonna find her. Where can she run and hide? Come on. You got this. You're the reason she's going to get caught. <laughs> so when she's in jail, you can go visit her and just laugh in her face. V spinning a web of lies large and small. She said that her dad would give her thousands of dollars when she was sad. She told me that her mom had just died of breast cancer. So who was the real V Lee? This person had the answers. V's estranged older sister, Marie Lee, who can recall the horrors she saw before her family fled war-ravaged Cambodia. Maybe she's not in door of life like I am, where witness death in front of you. And V, she never saw these things. No. V's parents struggled to succeed doing farm work and wanted their daughters to live the American dream. For V, her sister says, it was more like American hustle. I don't think she wants to work. Maybe she expects to just people hand her stuff because she was spoiled. Sweet-faced as a youngster, V never graduated high school, Marie says. Um, she skipped school a lot. I tell her, you know, if you're not going to school, you're going to have to work hard like me. Marie, what would she say when you told those things to her? She just brushed it off. It's more like, oh, whatever, it's none of your business. You're just my sister, you're not my mom. So for me, I just have to back off. Still, when V told her sister she was having boyfriend issues, Marie took her in, offering room and board in exchange for some nanny work. But then, one night, when Marie and her husband went to check their hidden lockbox, to their horror, they discovered $10,000 they had saved was missing. My husband screamed from upstairs. He's like, money's gone. My heart just dropped. So I said, we, did you take my money? So she denies it. Who else is have access to my room but you? Did she stay in your house after that? No, she never should come back. If you can't trust your sister. Yeah, you can't trust anybody. Now V is on the run. Wanted in two Oregon counties for forgery and identity theft. V deletes her social media accounts. Location unknown. On the evening of November 12th, Taylor feels certain that V will hit some big city clubs for her birthday the following night. She's gonna find as many rich people to hang around as possible and celebrate her birthday. Yet at that same moment, a thousand miles to the south in Los Angeles, V's newest friends, Jamie Charon and Margot Vallet, have grown suspicious of the club hopping, money mooching, teller of tall tales young woman who's been crashing on Jamie's couch. When they Google her name, the women are flabbergasted by what they find. There's Facebook pages that are dedicated to finding her, Twitter accounts. Immediately I look at Jamie and I said, this girl is psycho, like there's something wrong with her completely. So we called the cops. In Portland, less than three hours later, Detective Altier is sitting down with 2020 when suddenly his phone blows up. The LAPD has nabbed V. And after he tells Taylor the news. Oh my God, I can't even feel my legs. <laughs> months of pent up emotions are at last unleashed. I thought this wasn't going to happen. I, I did it. <laughs> I arrested, got V. Lee arrested. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> you scramble upstairs as events unfold rapidly. Yeah, that's actually, she's actually the victim in one of our warrants. V, you messed with the wrong girl. It's a pretty spectacular night, isn't it? It's great. I'm, I'm happy for Taylor. Hi, this is Taylor. Then a phone call from Portland to L.A.
You have no idea how grateful I am that you guys called the police tonight. Thank you. Oh, thank you. No, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have found her and this wouldn't have happened. Oh, and remember Taylor's $200 hair straightener? The one V ran off with? Do you have a red straightener? A red straightener? Yes! Oh my god, that's my straightener! Yup, we have it. Go! The next day, Marie Lee is sharing her stories of the estranged sister she hasn't heard from in nearly a year. Do you know what day in your sister's life this is? It's her birthday. Do you know where she is right now? I have no idea. She's in L.A. County Jail. For real? She was arrested last night in Los Angeles. Oh my God. She has to pay for what she did. She needs to admit it that I need help. There's no excuse. <laughs> We're gonna have so much fun carrying this up three flights. And with 2020 footing the bill and Detective Altier is okay, a box from LA arrives at Taylor's house. Taylor, Leilani, and Sonia sort through it for their stuff. And sure enough, there's the item that means so much to Taylor. Look what we got, lady. Is that your straightener? That's my straightener. These are the shoes that V bought with my credit card and was wearing around in my house. <laughs> but however V might have preyed on their openness and vulnerability, these young women weren't afraid to make some new friends. We'll yes. toast to V for our new friendship and group hugs. <laughs>